Hello everyone, today we talk about the 8th century Longbird army. In Schwerpunk's early days I discussed the Longbird army. You have those videos also re-uploaded after the um, say Creative Commons pictures re-editing. Uh, and so that's all good material as a basis that I see people tend to watch because sort of the, the Longbirds pull a bit the cart uh, more than the other topics. Uh, so today's video is um, really focusing on this century that is quite relevant. You have the full consolidation and at the same time the fall of the Longobard uh, government. Uh, I don't say kingdom because as we will explain as you already know right that the kingdom went on under Carolingian rule which was uh, basically the exception in in the Frankish conquest witnessing as always the, the great importance that eventually the renamed Italic because you know Longobard sounded too uh, chauvinistic right for um, uh, for uh, the occupants taste is uh, and uh, in any case it system went on and it went on with the same army with the same institution just the other day what was it that we were discussing about the ah yes the, the video about italic warfare that is sort of you see how the cycle randomly always end up linking the topics after all it's the continuation of this right I made the other day a video about italic warfare from the 9th to the 11th century um, I made other videos about also the strategicon about the uh, blonde-haired peoples by the South of Maurice that describes fundamentally most people in historiography say it describes the Franks but really in those years the the by far the, the major uh, Germanic element at fighting against and within the Byzantine military were the Longbirds right plus other Germanic groups that also were not the Franks but of course Germanic warfare was basically similar especially for these populations that the Byzantines came to to encounter and in any case I made the video you can check that out uh, as well so I will develop the, the various um, say topics uh, contained in, in this um, chapter along the way because uh, there is a lot politically institutionally socially militarily uh, there is the Carolingian conquest so all things we will deal with uh, in, in other dedicated videos uh, but that are important of course to put together um, in order to understand concretely what was the 8th century Longbird military so as I was saying before let's start with with Lutbrand let's start with the uh, full consolidation of the Longbird royal power at the beginning of the 8th century. Lutbrand was the greatest king of the Longbirds, at least in terms of um, Longbird power achieved in, in absolute terms historically, then you can say, well, Alboin was or Rotary was, right? But Lutbrand really was um, at the head during his reign, 712-744, of a pretty functional uh, state. Well, we can use this term because um, as I have explained at nauseam, the entire concept that the Longobard Kingdom was hopelessly fragmented among various duchies is actually not true. It may seem strange. I know that the Italian particularism in the following centuries may make you think, but they were all fragmented later. Yes, but at this time they actually were not, right? And the uh, various dukes had in good part, and especially in the most productive areas of the realm, that is Lombardy and Tuscany, uh, substituted gradually with uh, some uh, royal officials known as the Gastels. Yes, there was an autonomy, but it was not a situation like you would see, uh, I don't know, in, in, in the Frankish uh, kingdom, where at some point this thing fell apart in, in, the, in the second half of the 7th century. And at that point, actually, the Longbirds were the most, the, the, the largest and more powerful uh, Latin Germanic uh, kingdom at the time. It's uh, uh, underestimated. The same Lutbrand actually um, sent troops to Charles Martel, who asked him to fight, uh, to help the Franks fighting the Moors uh, in, in southern Gaul. There was even an attention towards Provence that 
something that the Italic Kingdom would have also later on in the same Carolingian partitions, and that had been already uh, so in Gothic times under Theodoric. Uh, there is um, a, say, full consolidation of the Longbird government, if anything, because of the ideological framing of the crown's uh, power. Right at this point, Lutbrand adopts the title of Catholic King. That, as we know, Schwerpunkt is not just saying, you know, in this case, we're not Aryans anymore. The, the Longobards fundamentally, you know, had a, a Catholic prevalence um, that was never challenged after that. Already in the second half of the 7th century, the same so-called Aryans, if you look even at the history of the Visigoths or the Vandals, etc., were not really um, complaining in a theological sense. Uh, on the contrary, the, the Longobard Kingdom, uh, w aside from the very beginning and very end um, of its history, was very supportive of papal orthodoxy, right? If you look at, broadly speaking, the Latin Germanic West, um, the locals were behaving in an incredibly correct way, uh, Christianly speaking, the doctrinally, theologically speaking, compared to what, whatever the Byzantines were doing. Um, and uh, this Catholic terminology refers not much, in fact, to the, to the Aryan past, but really to, as we will see now, an opening to some hegemonic ambitions of the Longobard kingdom that, if it hadn't been for the Carolingian conquest, would have objectively taken control of Rome, would have uh, surely united at least the entire uh, Italian peninsula, and would have surely gone ahead, especially um, in, in Dalmatia, perhaps also in Provence. We do not know that, right? The Carolingians, uh, at least Charlemagne and Louis de Pius, were lucky enough to, to be the only surviving uh, brothers of the bunch so that they had a united kingdom, but don't think uh, that um, the Carolingian Empire would simply, you know, had to exist because of that, because the Franks had that chronic problem. The Longobards did not really have that, right? There were some duchies that were surely more autonomous than the others, in, in particular the Langobard, the Aminar, made a video about that. Essentially, we're talking about the Longobards of, uh, of Benevent and Spoleto, right, in the southern part, essentially across the uh, the papal Byzantine territories. Um, but they had a functional elective monarchy. Nobody really, uh, since Autharis times, when the Byzantines had still a strong presence, many Longobards were actually uh, being uh, acting right as federati of the empire rather than free Longobards as such, um, in spite of, of course, you know, always seeking for autonomy in a way. Uh, so we're talking ab about an incredibly unitary history of the system that always recognized uh, the kingdom. Uh, there were even Beneventan kings that didn't have to conquer the north in order to be elected kings. You have a, mm, even in, for example, the northeast, the Longobard Austria, um, always a political and strategical mm, uh, overlapping of the, of the interest with of the crown of, of the kingdom as a whole, uh, and um, really there weren't turbulences like within the Frankish system that, as we will see, would turn out to be more powerful. But because it had been cultivating, in fact, an important degree of private power, um, the even a, a modest uh, magnate of of Gaul often had uh, even a larger estate than a single Longobard uh, king, and as such could cultivate some professional military elite that is the one that with the Carolingians uh, we all start to, to know right of course um, there's not really been a, a step uh, many people talk about Charles Martel I have a video coming on the same topic uh, regarding the, the invention of the heavier cavalry of, of all the system actually it was a very gradual system all right early medieval Europe had already seen cavalry regaining the upper hand over infantry. Uh, actually, the Franks at this point still considered the Longbirds and the surviving uh, Visigoths, or at least areas that were thought to be cultural Visigoths, as, as the better horsemen in the 8th century. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the Franks really had it, but it was understood that also these other peoples had had an important uh, chivalric equestrian culture. And this is very 
much connected also with the the, bit, the mystery of the not just the Longobard, but, but even the Carolingian army at the time of, of the conquest of 774, um, because we do not factually know too much, right? I have lots of videos about Carolingian um, warfare in store, where, you know, how how many oceans of things have been written about, I don't know, the Carolingian Brunia, uh, the Carolingian armor, what it looked like. Well, we know very few. We do not have uh, videos or photographs from the time, we do not have an overwhelming um, archaeological evidence. So this system, as huge as it was, um, was probably also homogeneous with, with other elements, especially in this case, but probably the Longobards and the Franks had the same identical kind of equipment um, in many ways, provided, of course, it was not uniform of standardized in terms of, of production, even when it, it reached an important scale. But in fact, this is the point. The Franks were, in a way, more morally loaded. They had, they were bigger. That's also another important factor that is often overlooked. Um, like the Longobard Kingdom and its center of power was just large as one of the chunks of of, of Francia, like of Neustria, of Austrasia. We're not talking about the other peoples that were all, already under the Franks. And yes, it's it is important to stress what the Carolingians were doing with their military, uh, their social engineering, but even like Wickham, Chris Wickham does um, in pointing out it was a, just, you know, the Longobards lost because of a social issue, they didn't have much of, of a, the same quantity of heavy cavalry as the Franks it's a bit too deterministic, structuralistic we will see it uh, later right, uh, in any case, again the Longobards were a hell of a power in their own regard um, They uh, under Lutbrand this was really evident, he was really he represented himself also through his um, uh, legislation as a sovereign of a state that, at least in the royal rhetorics, appeared territorially organized and centralized. Uh, and we know fa fairly a lot about Longobard society because this was a very uh, literate area. We have, fortunately, some also well-preserved archives like the Luke case one or a bit of a, uh, an incredible uh, you know uh, stroke of luck right for in terms of early medieval European documentation we we know how the Longobards lived largely right the fact that they were a urbanized society they had a lot of trade going on they were quite literate they had an important level of individual liberty because you know uh, wealth was much more evenly distributed in many ways uh, and so there were some issues we will talk about now because, of course, the system could not simply last as it was. Um, the idea is that also Longobard society was going towards a gradual um, fe proto-feudalization of some sort. But uh, I studied uh, these sources for some years, and I must say that the the evidence in this, and especially its reflection from a military point of view, it's not that. I mean, it's present, but it's not. Um, systemically uh, comparable with Frankish society, which truly was was a different thing. Um, there were some aspects of civilization that stand out. For example, the uh, Lanx ritual uh, at the time of, of the royal crowning was, had been abandoned. Right, Longobards as an elective marquee uh, in their in their laws were were about you know all ideally all the freemen or at least the most important one of the kingdom uh, uniting in Pavia and electing in the migration era style still the on the on the lances on the on the shield um, their their king right being acclaimed by the people in arms right and Longobards bear in mind that in spite of this civilization. Um, and actual romanization, linguistically, culturally, etc., never uh, compromised themselves, political or institutionally, from a formal point of view with the Romans, right? Here we will see some hints, some shade of that, but the Longobards had never mm, received or accepted any Roman, um, let's say, uh, delegation of power, um, differently from the Franks and pretty much any other Germanic people that had settled uh, in the former lands of the empire, um, even the Anglo-Saxons at a point start calling themselves um, Basileus, uh, Basileoi uh, in Greek, 
literally, not even in Latin, right? But that that's a bit later, telling the truth. But um, there, the Longobards were the Longobard people. Right? It's something you that uh, I made multiple videos about the origins of the Longobards, their uh, foundational myth, their laws, uh, the Historia Longobardorum, and we'll keep talking about the stuff because it's really interesting. But they never, you know, like they they are the Germanic people par excellence, right? A people's people, right? Not um, a people of a, a dynastic people, or so like the Goths, right? Or the, the tell the history just of an oligarchy, etc. Longbirds had always cared about this more egalitarian liberty from an individual point of view, and objectively, post Gothic War Italy had provided them with the pulver prior pulverization of the of the latifundia with that exact balance right with a per capita wealth that would last as the highest in the world um very differently again from france say where say an enormous amount of wealth was concentrated in the hands of very few people and that made that difference organizationally imperially etc um and and so still you see that the longbirds are have already achieved actually have already reached a very important level of civilization of um, legalization of territorialization right and uh, their same crowning ritual um, had started at adopting some forms of roman imperial uh, derivation this was normal again with connecting this with the catholic title etc you realize that in the peculiar italian context all this symbolized, um, in a sense, of course, the uh, de Romanization or Italianization of the monarchy and the people, of course, um, but also uh, their new expansionistic ambitions, right? Because now the last Byzantine avant posts were basically uh, to, to be wiped out. Um, these were lands that were inhabited technically by still Romans, juridically speaking. I mean, they were just identical to the guys that lived on the Longbird side. They were Italians, broadly meant, right? Uh, and I made multiple videos on this topic, how it was like Byzantine Italy, Longbird Italy. They were actually very similar places, um, especially after the 7th century uh, and so on. Um, but juridically, and as far as Wu did have to rule, like, considering that still the there was an empire out there. Constantinople was had the power had shrank right in the previous centuries, and so this had facilitated the Italian decentralization and everything. But there was the point of how do we deal with these guys that are juridically Romans, right? These are have to be new subjects, uh, and up to now we have ruled only on the Longbirds, or at least the, the broader population that has become Longbird by now, uniformly. Like we do not have evidence, basically, of Romans um, in this context, if not merchants, in fact, from the Byzantine areas. So everybody in Longbird Italy had become a Longbird from quite a while, uh, uh, in spite of if there had been any uh, subdivision at the beginning between the conquerors and the over demographically overwhelming Roman majority. At this point, they were all one, right? And this is also pretty clear. It's not another... At least, um, it's not such a long, uh, uh, say, uh, a hard-to-die myth as much as the idea of the Longobard polit kingdom political territorial fragmentation, but it's also one of the things in which 19th century nationalistic German Italian historiography wrote too much, left an everlasting impact. Also, the famous Alessandro Manzoni wrote uh, about this in good faith because he actually, for, for his times, he was even a good historian, right? But the idea is that they had stopped look, finding Roman names in longer Italy, so they assumed at some point that the Romans leave the sub, some sort of subspecies hidden in, you know, in caves or whatever. Actually, no, right? Basically, everybody had become Longobard, and uh, this was a kingdom of cities, of law, uh, of order, actually, right? And of mm, striking stability. Liutbrand's uh, successor, Heistulf, that had been uh, the Duke of Friuli, Liutbrand was instead uh, uh, a Neustrian, right? From Lombardy, from the, from the western part of the Povale. Um took on the very significant title of, quote, uh, 
king of the Longbirds, to whom God had entrusted the people of the Romans. This is particularly powerful, the Roman people, if you prefer. Um, there was already, I don't know, in Aguilar's times, there were titles like... Um, just some days ago we made a video about Ethelstan, uh, Rex uh, Totius Britannia. Well, I, um, Agilulf, before him, um, had had the similar titles, um, Agilulfus Grazia Dei, Rex Totius Italia. And that was particularly important because, again, of the Byzantine presence. That was this, uh, you know, r relic, right, of, of, of a power that had lost the the initiative for good, basically, since the early 7th century, that, however, the Longbirds had left there, they had been eroding, essentially, Byzantine territory a tiny bit at a time, they had not pressed too hard, uh, and they had let the broader social, cultural, demographic mechanisms actually make the, the pendulum swinging from, from their side by this point. And um, Lutbrand, Heistolf, etc. were the guys who basically took, at some point, lost, but because of internal plots of the city, not because of the empire, uh, Ravenna. So that, that was especially the, the strongest Roman area, right? The Exarchate had remained politically a, an important thing. There were other enclaves in southern Italy along the coast, but there wasn't much there, much of a stronger, strong sense of Romanity. Uh, especially the Exarchate was, again, closer to the Longbirds, the people living there were also important, so um, for, uh, and similar to the to the Longbirds, as we've seen. So, uh, res say, inventing, actually, because this was the first time the Longbirds ever began to speak about, you know, being rulers of the Romans, was um, necessary to integrate these other provinces, territories, which had been ruled by the Byzantine Empire, now basically passing under the Longbird uh, control, without even m major military expeditions or anything. Just Rome would, would not fall, because, of course, there was a, was a big city that the Longbirds besieged it, also later on at this time, um, with, with impressive organization, actually, from all over the, the peninsula, you know, the various armies gather, the various contingents gathering, the various sides of Rome, say, the gates uh, from the direction which the, the troops had come uh, from the other provinces. It's an interesting military history, but it, it was never so escalatory and big and, you know, um, and, and uh, like, really put together to, to the extent that the Carolingians at this point would conquer even Italy. It was, as you know, a major logistical and strategical fit, especially because of the Alps, the double route of invasion, um, and so on. So, Longobard society had also changed over time. As we have explained, the ethnic divide between the Longobards and the Romans had by this time been surpassed. Um, the fact that in the Exarchate there were Romans that now had been concentrated there, now were um, roaming uh, for say more in, into the rest of the Longbird Kingdom would say would make them say okay well yes you're a Roman but only in the sense that you came from places like Ravenna or whatever in the Longbird Law you could mm, you could actually be judged uh, if you wanted on request under Roman Law uh, you could sign contracts the Roman forms etc. Uh, this was valid uh, also in Carolingian Italy. If you wanted to do it the Frankish way, the Longbird way, the Roman way, it was okay. In many ways, there is also the all the issue that we have discussed legally about, you know, how what what did it mean to be Roman juridically? Because we do not know how much the Corpus Iuris Civilis circulated at this point, not much. So even the Romanity of these Romans in a legal sense was some sort of local... Uh, custom that uh, unfortunately is not documented because the Longbird law would be hegemonic um, and uh, very advanced and developed and functional. It was very effective, so much so that Roman law it itself in the Bolognese studium uh, 300 years later was resumed by Longbirdist jurists that were essentially trying to, to reconstruct it, trying to fill the gap that only at the time, in a feudal time, in the, with the Holy Roman Empire, etc., was was necessary, but up to that point, the Longbird uh, 
law was uh, kept being used, actually in southern Italy, it remained until the 19th century in the Neapolitan, in the Neapolitan um, uh, law, right? So that's quite fascinating uh, in itself. I made videos about this, about medieval law, especially explaining how this, this happened. But to make the long story short, basically everybody who resided within the boundaries of the Longobard kingdom were considered Longobards. Right. Uh, Italy was known as Langobardia abroad by the Arabs, by the Frank, by anybody. Right. Um, and um, these people, even if they identified as Longobards, as something lasting long, even th these were Romance people, they spoke um, Latin or something transitioning towards uh, Italian. But they had. Th they were convinced and truly uh, believing, of course, that they were Longobards, that they were actually a Germanic people as such. I mean, they understood that they weren't Germanic as the guys who lived just next uh, across the Alps, with whom they had important contacts, especially the Bavarians were also the Longobards, or originally these were Elbe Germans. They, they had much about their tongue in common with the Swabians, the Alamanni in common as well. Um, but as far as their political identity was concerned, they were Longobards. And especially in this sense, they were not Romans. There is a beautiful passage by Lutbrand uh, of Cremona in his Ant Anthropologist, if I'm not wrong, that tells this against the Byzantines. Like, we want to use the term Roman against you, like, because we, we do that to, to say, like, to an inferior person. But we are the Longobards, the, the, the Saxons, the Bavarians, etc. He, he says that explicitly, right? And it's quite fascinating. Because this Longobard kingdom had been a hell of an achievement, thanks to Romanization, thanks to uh, the, the Germanic uh, tradition, uh, they had created this unique statal system that Charlemagne was enamored with to the point of bearing it, its crown at the same level of the Frankish one and not uh, disbanding it as it had uh, happened to the other peoples subjected, conquered by, by the Franks. Right? Um, so, within this context, you also realize, again, the, the, the kingdom is expanding. Uh, we are in the 8th century, that, as you know, is before the 10th. There's a bit of crisis um, still in between. Is a moment of major economic revival from the previous centuries, for the so-called Dark Ages, that lasted at longest, basically, a century, a century and a half, and again, Italy was very well uh, connected, it had cities, it, it was fertile, it was in the center of the Mediterranean, uh, it was close to, to the Byzantines, and it, it worked as a as a, a hub with, um, with, with Central Europe as well, with the Franks that also were quite big uh, as an economy, and so um, you can see more wealth around. Right, socially speaking, uh, inequality increased. You have a uh, growth in importance of the great landowners that, again, however, in Italy are not threatening, uh, like uh, in Gaul, as private lords with their uh, military retinues to the point of challenging royal. Power. No, these these at best compete uh, for the public offices in the cities within the royal hierarchy. So that that's why this becomes so important. But as we were explaining the other day in the video about Italic warfare, um, still their say their wealth is remarkable. Um, given that as we've seen there were also mm, there was a, an even wealth distribution, you find these people not really being under a single again major lord um, but uh, acting autonomously as well so that even within a single duchy you had still a balance of power in that regard. Um, you see these landowners being tied often to churches, monasteries, or episcopal sees. It's basically the mechanism we've seen al already, like with the later episcopal military clientele. So where about these people, right? Living in the city, but having land, of course, in the uh, adjacent countryside. And having the the moral material means, of course, to be also more effective fighters, right? Um, and these men, together with the uh, loyal, say, with the, the royal retinues, right, of 
trustees um, that uh, sometimes were the same people telling the truth came to constitute an important political uh, elite within the Langobardia, right? This had, say, already been the case, but now that the monarchy had managed to extend its control in a more uh, orderly, uh, uniform, and sort of um, controlled fashion, right, there, there was a bit more social engineering attention for, again, all these chunks of the enlarging kingdom to remain ever more compact. And, of course, these clientels were relevant to um, to achieve it, given that every once in a while some duke did have to be reminded uh, where he his loyalty laid, or simply, you know, he was a guy that had been elected by the local uh, aristocracy, but for some reason the, the kings in Pavia did not like his policy, they were sort of more tending towards autonomy, or maybe they were even winking at Byzantines, a typical of Spoleto, where you have, in fact, some simple royal expeditions from the Po Valley that are not um, crowned by sieges or whatever, major battles, bloodshed. No, because simply this army entered the city, they changed Duke, or they appointed a gas cell, and they came back to the Paul Valley, and everything worked until the guy was uh, was alive, right? It was not a particularly violent reality. Um, but we do know, and we would like admittedly to know more about military expeditions, right? Some of them were present against, for example, the, the Slavs, the others in the northeastern uh, frontier, but this mostly involved uh, the Friuland Dutch, I made a video about that, which was in fact a bit more warlike, a bit more um, even traditionalist uh, in uh, Longobard, in the ancient Longobard customs, right? And I made a video about the Battle of the Livenza River that we will mention later, but if you have watched that, we, you know what we're talking about. And in any case, um, the say uh, the, the Paul Valley was was not invaded, was not threatened, right? The Friulans alone managed to to stem. Um, these uh, more uh, troublesome populations in the east, at best they had some Slavic piracy in the Adriatic, right? Some local dukes having to take out this guy's landing sack in some place. But again, it, it was a generous before early medieval standards here, um, a pacified dimension. Like war um, was uh, relatively rare, especially on a large scale, right? And it's not until the Franks knock at the door uh, for specific um, international reasons, the, the popes calling them, etc., that things started to get to get heated up. So around these more powerful individuals, we described a bit like the, the elites with their clientels, you have in fact this retinues that did uh, get rewarded for their service with land or other revenues. Uh, in exchange, of course, of their military service and aid, right? Um, the most famous uh, of these clients were the so-called Gazindi. It's a term, if you have studied Longobard history, surely, and warfare especially, it's known to you, who were tied to the Longobard king by a an oath of fealty that in part did recall the Frankish model of uh, vassalage uh, that however was not say again brought that privatistic extreme right the oaths of allegiance were present everywhere right in contracts in the positions in, in, in also and obviously in a military context right where of course these peoples maintained their own traditional awareness the, the spirit that the, the Longobards as you know were very connected with St. Michael as an inferic uh, force and you know that uh, reminded them of say of their uh, tales about Odin etc like Paul the Deacon also does even when of course the, he's a full Christian at that point it was just a character of um, of the people the Gazindi however uh, and I say this uh, because you you do see these names around or even in video games etc were not really um, necessarily a, a military thing Right, these guys were a bit some factotum, right? Uh, they were political advisors, um, they had a control in the various communities because they were the uh, bit the, the local magnates, they, they knew how to make things work, 
right? Not just through violence, right? This is not just like the, the Carolingian Antrustiones that were just true, uh, you know, uh, merciless thugs that spent their entire life, of course, massacring, raping, this, and, and that was their full, proud, elite, professional, military identity, right? Here you have, of course, a military capacity, we will see now, but it's not that prof military professional profile that you would see again in, in the Frankish army, right? So the creation, however, of these relations was fundamental in the composition of the Longobard army. You can argue that this is in fact the glue that kept it together still to, to that political and social degree that is reflected just in the military organization. Um, and that the Longobard army still depended importantly on the, avail the say the the, the, avail the economical availability of the freemen, right? It was still a fairly archaic system because, again, wealth was enough widespread to have still an idea of, okay, look, we are a people in arms and uh, ideally if we have to go out to war, we will just summon the levy and everybody will maybe not literally think materially about just their own equipment. Again, this Gazin, the other... Uh, figures would provide uh, for the supplies, the logistics, the, the dukes had some system like that, the gastels as well. Uh, surely the, the monarchy, uh, even if we do not have the, the exact data, they took care of that in in many ways. Right? There was an important degree of autonomy in this military administration, um, and that makes you understand that there wasn't quite a um, much of a military hierarchy of... Um, dramatically concentrated resources, again, in the hands of uh, truly structured, you can say de facto permanent uh, military elite, right? Everything was how pretty much, basically, in the entire Romano-Germanic uh, warfare, things had always been working. And if you look at the Anglo-Saxons at this point, they're basically the same. If you look at the Saxons, continental Saxons, they're, but even among the Slavs, I mean, the, the entire recruitment system functioned since the migration era and before pretty much in the same way. I mean, the same Roman military uh, recruitment criteria, practically the same. Um, so the Franks are the true and big exception, right? Nobody really had an army like the Franks. Uh, and we can say in the sense that the Longbirds were really normal, were really average, and probably they have been downplayed a bit because the idea of Charlemagne crushing the longer birds, and so the, the idea of a bit of the stereotype of the great French knight and the, and the long bird merchant of the later Middle Ages, um, these are a bit old stereotypes that were, let's say, um, repeated over the centuries, then contributed to this idea that the long birds sort of sucked at war. Uh, but it's technically not true, and in part we will explain why later. There's no doubt that the Franks were stronger. Um, it, it's macroscopically self-evident. It's just by the, the size, the, the, especially the logistics. I mean, hell, the, I mean, Charlemagne, you, you can't argue that, he, you can't say literally he was a military genius because we're not in a time in history in which you can, maybe he was, right, but you, you do not have literally the, the military complexity that allows you to judge that. But in terms of planning, Right, putting together logistically and pulling off, especially the the invasion of Italy, the destruction of the other Kaganate. I mean, those were major operations across the Alps along the Danube. Um, they, they, we will. I still have to make uh, a video about Carolingian logistics, and surely I will make more about that because it was shocking, traumatically shocking to say the least. What what the Franks managed to pull off again, but in terms of strict essence of what these peoples were um, in Western Europe, Southwestern Europe, they were pretty much the same. Again, also in arms and armor, right? Don't think that the difference between the Franks and the Longobards really lays in that. We'll talk now about this a bit. Um, in any case, the Longobards, exactly for this, they had uh, the, uh, their, own, uh, their own military administration, as just said. There wasn't such a thing, apparently, like the state managing to pay a salary for the soldiers, right? So the composition of the army depended fundamentally on, as we've seen, the, the local resources, how the Dutchies had historically handled that. 
uh, and how they, they could coordinate with uh, Pavia and the other the other provinces uh, of of the realm, right? And in this way, the distribution of private or fiscal lands to the various followers represented a, a tendency, other than than an effective method, to allow them to arm themselves adequately. So the Gazim, in many ways, yes, were rewarded at some point with some land, right? Some places in some areas that the king could, for a reason or another, uh, give it to them so that they would uh, compact a bit of some more reliable clientele and would also facilitate things uh, politically and so militarily wise. Then we do find these so called military laws issued by King Heistulf in 750 that are, uh, again, the typical Romano Germanic uh, recruitment uh, laws system. Um, and that um, I also described somewhere, I don't remember, surely in the videos about, I don't know, the one about Longbert infantry, or whatever, that uh, delineate clearly what basically this army was recruited like and it was pretty much the same. This was issued, by the way, in the time which the Franks were already there. They had already uh, threatened Italy and Heistulf, as you know, fought multiple times against them, even being defeated. You gotta give the man. He was always back on his feet and actually he died in a, in a hunting accident. He fell from a horse. Um, but they knew their deal, right? They had a, an idea of what they had to do in order to, to put their forces together, how to defend their kingdom, even if they were defeated repeatedly by the Franks. So I will read, I would read in Latin normally, but i just paraphrase here uh, the recruitment laws by Heistulf. Uh, it is, uh, it remains the same, that that man that has seven Masarician houses, now this was a general, like the Mansus, like a, a, a land plot unit measure, right? It's not much about the extension but of the, of the land, but of the actual wealth. So the guy that has the seven Masarician houses must have his cuirass with the rest uh, of the equipment and he must have also horses, right? So this was essentially the heavily armored um, knight practically with uh, other spare horses, right? This was the, the shock elite cavalry, right? And if he has more than seven houses, for this number he must have the horses and also the 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 rest of the armament in, in excess even. Um, we also want that those men that do not have Masarician houses, so some sort of farmland, uh, you know, uh, communities, and they have 40 ujra of land, the ujra it was, as you know, a Latin, um, another Latin uh, land plot unit measurement. Um, they must have horse, shield, and lance, Right, so it's obvious that the first category must have had these two, but these guys were apparently not to be provided with the cuirass, right? So you have some sort of medium cavalry. Um, and so, um, as the prince decides, uh, which is the king here, um, the lesser people, lesser men, that uh, if um, they can have the shield, they must also have the quiver with the arrows and the bow, right? So this is interesting because you see some sort of double function of, uh, you know, heavy infantry, but provided also with some side weapon in the bow, right? And those men that are merchants and they do not have cattle or chattel, I don't know how you say that in English, those who are powerful and the greater ones must have cuirass and horses, um, shield and lance, and those that... Um, follow them in wealth must have horse, shield, and lance, and those who have uh, less, who are less, must have a quiver with arrows and bow. Right? So now this is interesting because it, um, you see, to, to the guys that, uh, like, the, the average Longobard landowner didn't need to, to be told, 
especially if he was part of the elite, uh, how he had to go equipped, right? Just they stressed, you must have the cuirass, that's very important, so that we can have the true elite cavalry. Um, the interesting aspect, rather, is that there is a parallel uh, hierarchy based on the new mercantile class, right? There are merchants that are evidently just by lifestyle, not men of war. They're not particularly involved even in their private businessmen in the, in the Stato um, administration. Um, and uh, as such, they must be remembered that they have to serve basically in the same way. Perhaps Eistulf issued this because before this was a time of emergency, but they hadn't required this maybe to the merchants, which is unlikely, but maybe to an extent that had not been clarified, and this is part of the reason why they, they were issuing this law uh, as well, perhaps. And the idea uh, being here that all this broader population and its wealth had to be put at the service of the um, of the state. And the, in the interesting aspect here is um, that the infantry doesn't appear to be particularly relevant, right? Or at least... Uh, it, it was surely less relevant than it had been during the migration era. Because you see here just basically one, um, uh, let's say the, the, the landed uh, element must have the shield, so implying here maybe a side weapon, a sword, a, a lance, whatever. Well, the mercantile one is reminded that they must have all the various equipment, but the last section... Uh, does uh, must have just uh, they must just be archers, right? So th there is a an inequality uh, in these parallel classes, um, and it doesn't seem well. Of course, there would be a, a majority of infantrymen, right, in all armies, including the Carolingian one, of course. Um, but um, it's evident that the major interest for the Longbert king at this point was to have especially well-equipped horsemen as well. Um, there is a slight difference, as I was saying, with migration era warfare, right? We do not have, say, for the 6th century uh, recruitment laws uh, from the Longbirds. Heistulf's ones at the end of the kingdom are basically the only ones, and again, every Romano-Germanic kingdom basically had the same identical way of recruiting troops. But we do know that, say, in the 6th century, and I described this at length in other videos, uh, thanks to the fact that the Longbirds, being still largely pagan, or at least not caring much about being buried themselves in arms, provided us, in this through, through this funerary um, uh, burials, of a lot of material evidence, right? And we do know basically, even not in Italy, sometimes even already in Pannonia, right at the time of the wars against the Gepids, etc., um, with a pretty large amount of um, well-armed infantrymen, right? It's not entirely clear, telling you the truth, how many of those guys would be mounted, right? Because not everybody could bury a horse, which actually was done. There are literally, if you visit, for example, the Museum of Cividale of Friuli, you find the, the actual horse, the actual guy buried together. And those were guys, again, they, they look like a steppe people, right? But they were long birds, and it, I mean, some elements would have been from the steppes, literally. Um, not just because Pannonia, in part, is steppes, but literally, I mean, they, they could have been Iranians, as far as we're, we understand. But the more statistic evidence from the Longbird cemeteries shows us that in the early generations of one of the settlement, the Longbirds had a um, remarkably well balanced um, uh, armament, right? And, and socially speaking, you had essentially a, a very strong bulk of freemen that were truly the, the backbone of the Longbird army. Apparently, this favored them against other peoples. For example, the Gepids had a very powerful elite, but they had sclerotized uh, the system because they had reduced instead the freemen in a in a condition of I mean the the people in a condition of poverty. Like the the average Gepid freeman has a miserable burial compared to the uh, 
to the Longberg one. And the sense, again, of the strength of the people, of the bunch, um, almost a Roman fascist I I idea, right? And the, the Germans truly were about that in, a, in, in, in very strong ways. I remember that the Longberg's were under this profile extremely archaic in a, in a truly Germanic identitary sense. So they cared very much about their people's tradition, and the, the power of their, um, even of their average warrior. They could have normally a sword, for example, which in the 6th century, especially in the second half, of it's, it's not that, you know, to something you have to bet on just per se, right? So if we compare this with the late 8th century, when we unfortunately don't have burials uh, with arms and armor, but we read what these recruitment laws are issuing, you realize that cavalry, heavy cavalry, in a sedentary context, and not in a semi-domatic one, like the longer bursts of, of the migration, had increased particularly in, in importance. As we were saying before, the older equestrian traditions had sort of been, had died out, because again, these people had settled in a urban, civilized context, etc. Uh, and what you see, in fact, in, even in the revival of, say, cavalry during the High Middle Ages, even in the Frankish world, is that Yes, there are lots of migration era influences. I, I have an entire playlist, the one dedicated to medieval knighthood, explaining that. But it's it's an overwhelmingly sedentary and heavy, and in fact, even much heavier than the steppes or the the Oriental, you know, um, military traditions. Right, that is being created here. Right, uh, as we've observed before. However, and likely at this point. Uh, under Carolingian uh, siege, the Longbirds were realizing that systemically they had not cultivated again this feudal society like the Franks, and so they did have heavily armored horsemen, but they were likely not as many as the Franks, and or at least um, they were just smaller than the Franks, and they were trying here to squeeze all every resource to um, try to to oppose right functional effective forces against their transalpine uh, enemy at this point. Otherwise, the Franks and Longbirds weren't that enemy. They actually were allies most of their his sedentary history. I mean, and as they had founded their kingdoms, there had been some issues between the two. But overall, like also the idea that the, the Longbirds would have been against the Catholics or against the Franks, no. They actually all liked each other very much, right? They exchanged their princes at the various, at the royal court. They they had a very strong sense of um, of their Germanic epos as well. The Alboin was a great hero, of also of the Norse epos, for example. Plus, Italy was the land of Dietrich von Bern, um, Theodoric of Verona, right? And um, there was something great about this land that, of course, was the land of the Romans. So you couldn't quite unsee. Uh, even the achievement of the Longbirds you know, at the end of the migration here and all what they had managed to, to put together also in a civil way. Again, there were people traveling across the Alps. Uh, we see them, uh, we know them, especially at this point, there were lots of Longbirds also fleeing at this point Italy to go living in France because they knew what was going to come, right? But there were also Frankish merchants and, and etc., right? And we, we explained the centrality, of course, of the peninsula at this point. Um, so, there is no doubt here that the compared to the, the early days, right, the good old time, where the most important thing was spiritual in nature, right, the, the sort of egalitarian participation of all the adult, able-bodied males, in the idea of high stuff now, the late 8th century, uh, the backbone of the Longbird army had to be constituted by horsemen subdivided in heavy coerced units formed by the major land owners. Um, you see here that the seven Masoretian houses are seen as something beyond, right? The other guys must have 40 huge era, right? It's, it's a different scale of wealth. But also by the richest merchants that were not uh, particularly uh, reliable warriors just by lifestyle, like other guys that instead had been uh, 
more habitually involved in military expedition under the kings as the Gazindi and so on. Um, but they, they would do, maybe they, they would have just to provide um, the, the horse, the, the armament, right? Maybe somebody else would fight uh, in their stead. This was typical also in communal Italy later on at some point. Um, and you have then lighter troops, uh, some sort of medium cavalry e equipped with, with a war horse, uh, or maybe something in between, um, and uh, shield the length, right? So supporting the, the heavies. Uh, and obviously enough, uh, these troops were supported, comforted, aided by the infantry. That is provided with still one important missile um, potential uh, that wasn't, however, I mean, if it's missile, it's lighter infantry. Here, the fact that it seems there, there were inf heavy infantrymen with bows as well is uh, it's not too typical, honestly. I have to make a bit more research on this, um, but um, we don't have to think it was it is dramatic. That's normally something you see in a step context. And especially, actually, in a mounted one. Here, they are infantrymen. This means likely they have just to bring this kind of equipment. Then eventually, how they fought, unfortunately, we have no idea. Consider that throughout all Carolingian warfare, the only battle that we can reconstruct tactically is the Battle of Zuntal. By the way, one of the uh, few Carolingian defeats, even as you know, against the Saxons. But just, it's completely normal for the 8th century to literally know nothing, I mean literally nothing about how a battle goes, right? So unfortunately we're, we, we do not know how they felt, we do, we do not know how they're organized really. And um, we have to rely on narrative sources that are pretty vague at this point in history, pretty fragmentary and uh, that just knew what happened, they didn't even need to explain you, right, uh, more than a millennium later. Uh, always remembered that. Uh, And, um, yeah, and th there is also, of course, at this point still, an important uh, need, uh, capacity, and necessity of cavalry to dismount at a certain point, right? Uh, that was true, for example, for the Carolingians who were cut down by the Saxons at the same aforementioned Zuntel. I can think at the locks of the Susa Valley or other places in the Longbird defensive system that was something standing since Roman times, right, to some extent. we will ha I will have to make a major video on that because it's one of those topics to say, how did these guys defend their own countries, especially such a, in such case where, you know, with the Alpine Arc and all the various valleys, it, they were pretty complex, refined defensive systems. Of course, as it happened in this context, if the main army doesn't perform like these defenses these fortifications are useless, at least at the locks. Then there is the siege of Pavia that last nine months. It's the longest siege in uh, Carolingian history, and by far, that's often overlooked. But that's a strategy that Longberts had already employed later on, before. I mean, in in the in uh, in the sixth, in the early seventh century, when the, the Franks and the Byzantines had tried to knock them out, right, and invaded the Po Valley, but they. They did not connect with one another. They, the plague broke out, and the long birds behind their city walls, right, just you know, um, were scoring big time. So, as we just noticed, the mass of the freemen, those that in long bird terminology were called exercitales, which means the men of the army, the men of the exercitus, right. Uh, so also the Arimani, it was an equivalent also in Longobard law with freemen, right? If you were a freeman, you also had the duty and the privilege of participating in the army. You were an exercitalis as well, at times also known as an Arimanus. So it was a hallmark of liberty, right? And uh, there was a, a strong sense of, in fact, uh, even of nobility connected with that. We explain how the... Italian communal armies later on were actually based on the same concept. The citizens that had remained freemen all along um, considered themselves literally as noblemen in virtue of this, in, in the full wake of the Romano-Germanic tradition, because originally that was the case. Then we are habituated a bit more to the idea that uh, 
again it's the Frankish model prevailing um, in Europe uh, as in Italy actually because you know heavy cavalry of course increases dramatically even after uh, the same communes have are basically never ruled by infantrymen but th the sense is that um, the the Franks take over is this with this extreme elite system right but the idea that technically anyone who had who could bear arms and in this sense challenging an enemy you know imperial status would was stemming from when you look at the Lombard League wars against the Hohenstaufen, etc., from this early mentality, right, of Romano Germanic liberty acquired, especially by these municipal uh, communities that were extremely jealous and proud of their own prerogatives, bearing arms and uh, remaining fundamentally independent. Um, so, in here, we see instead that this infantry as a wall. Right, uh, the the average uh, longbird possessor, etc., is fundamentally uh, that would have been the, the most common guy, right, the peasant, right, out there um, in the countryside was relegated to a secondary role of some sort, right. There had already been a in in the longbird uh, settlement in Italy a, a process of again of social certification. Doesn't matter how balanced this place in the world, really makes it, making the exception uh, for wealth distribution really was, still, again, we're talking about the early Middle Ages, they are violently miserable times uh, in so many ways. Um, and the fact that they were equipped with quiver and bow, and which doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't, actually, they didn't have some sort of, uh, you know, blades of spears as well, however, indicates clearly that... Um, they were some sort of auxiliary troops, right? They were incapable of holding the ground by themselves. If they were just more commonly uh, archers, uh, this doesn't mean that the majority of Longobard infantry was made up of archers. We do not have any evidence of this. We don't have it for any other place, right? But so still you realize that there was an important amount of troops that were equipped just with that um, next to an infantry of spearmen, basically, and then this segmented cavalry where the, with the cuirassed spearhead, right? And the text could implicitly um, also signify that the exemption from military service uh, was uh, accepted for those men that were so poor that they couldn't afford even the shield. Hence, the, that would explain, like, the shield in next to the quiver and an arrow, right? That it was just a measure of uh, also their one personal defense capability, and those guys were better used as labor force at home, that is manpower on the battlefield. Um, and at this point, any, again, uh, ancestry difference uh, had ceased to count, right? You would have... Or you see here mostly a sensual uh, criterion, right? The level of wealth um, and uh, the Roman subjects of the exarchate heirs that would have been recruited in the same way. As we observed before, the importance of mounted troops had actually increased over time, right? The uh, archaeological evidence confirms the gradual assimilation between social preeminence and mounted fighting. This was already true uh, since the origin of the people, right? Uh, it's by now uh, accepted historiographically that the funerary ri uh, rituals represented a, a fundamental moment in the definition of the social hierarchies. Um, and so the grandiosity of a burial uh, had to render manifest um, in the right, uh, in the face of the world, in other words, and, and of God, right, the greatness of the deceased, and consequently also the one of his uh, descendants and the heirs, right, and already in many tombs of the seventh century is evident uh, that uh, the cavalryman status of the dead is emphasized, is highlighted, right, sometimes again by burying the guy with the entire horse, right? We, we actually have this, as we were saying before, uh, even in sedentary Italy. But more frequently, 
introducing symbolical elements, such as a saddle, a bite, or the spores. We have this also for young people. There is even the tomb of a young girl that was buried with uh, some stirrups, for example, that uh, would have been used at that point just for teaching her how to horse ride. But it's still relevant because um, you see that this people was just acquainted with, with cavalry to, to an extensive degree, especially in the moment in which they um, settled uh, in the Italian peninsula. They had received heavy steps, um, influences, especially from by the Huns. We have we know this uh, from an early time, but also the Iranian elements surely were among them. Later on, it's mostly a social prohemience in a sanitary context that makes, again, the, the elite. And so the majority of the people tends to sort of um, gentrify to an extent that, yes, they would have still, um, as long birds, identified with a certain equestrian culture and games and, and so on. We know, unfortunately, too few about this, but we can imagine even the, you know, the later, uh, you know, uh, communal jousts, etc., being connected with this early times. They had existed since Roman times. The Romans had the Epica Gymnasia, the, the similar thing, so it was a bit shared, right? But of course, um, during the 7th century, we lose basically this archaeological evidence because the Longobards are fully Christianized. They also move away from that warlike lifestyle um, on average, and so they we don't have that evidence anymore. That, that's how it happens. We're, we're lucky for just a few peoples in, in, in this context. It's just the Alamanni, for example, that take another century to stop burying their dead without weapons. Um, but, as we were saying before, even for the Franks and the Longbirds, we do not have in general much evidence about, in fact, what in the 8th century they could have looked like. We, we have an idea from the iconography, from other things, but let's say the quantities involved in terms of how much arms and armor were actually produced, uh, how, how they were distributed by whom, what were the, the connections with the royal administration, etc. That's unfortunately all lost. We have no idea, we have no clue. We can, uh, of course, have theories. Uh, it's not difficult to imagine how these things could work, but uh, it's just a, a field in which we can't... Uh, there, there are, there's basically no armor for, for this time. We have just pieces of chain mail from some uh, helmets, um, you know, the barding behind it, this kind of stuff, and but we, we can't see there that they were pretty much alive, right? For the earlier times, we have mostly lamellar armor for... The, basically, it's a step armor, as you know, the, from from Hungary to Vladivostok, basically, you find the same identical design throughout the, the millennia, even. Um, but, of course, in the 8th century, they would have looked much more Western, in many ways, even though let's always stress that even well through the middle, the later Middle Ages, the 13th, the 14th century, in countries like Germany and Italy, you you find Eastern enough in this sense, still interesting um, combinations, right, of uh, step influence or stuff like that, and and we're talking about Germany and Italy. They are definitely not they 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 do fully well. Germany is more exposed to only true to the steps. But Italy is, is fully Western in this sense, and, and yet there is uh, an influence likely through the Byzantines. Uh, we have seen it in many, many episodes, but we still have to make a medieval Italian warfare introduction for between the 11th and 14th century. At some point, ho will hopefully come. Uh, but even after arms and armor were stopped being buried, you realize that the, the myth of the horsemen was still alive. Right, we have uh, this uh, uh, idea that the landowner, of course, is a horseman, as we've seen. The, the, the kingdom requires him to serve as such in case, right, of need. It was just a prerogative. It was a way of Again, this was an orderly civilized society, but it was still an early medieval one, right? There was violence, there were clans, there was a you know, a need to go around armed. We know it pretty well, right? They they normally went to church with their armed retinues or 
something like that. So it was, again, a matter of showing power, right? There were other ways. We have written testaments, uh, better defined um, forms of power transmission of the, uh, the landed assets and so on. So you, you would know, generally speaking, who was r powerful or not in that society. It's just the the burials that do not show arms and armor anymore, but we can imagine, of course, many longbird freemen, especially the most powerful one, going around armed, because it was just the prerogative of their virility, of their nobility, as we've seen, and the fact that they were bearing the cingulum militaris, and so they had a, a piece of imperium here. Remember that title we read, uh, we read before about Heistulf, to whom God has entrusted the Roman people. Well, the Roman people was the one of the imperial Catholic tradition, was the one that had created, had repristinated the golden age in the world. And the Longbirds were in Italy, and they were ruling, in fact, over these other peoples, even though basically the Romans, as a whole, had become Longbirds in Italy. Um, and as such, there was an immense pride behind this story. It's, it's the idea that you have been entrusted by God, the protection of that people that once had transfigured all the others to allow the world to be saved, for Christ even to have been born under Augustus and beyond. I mean, it's something that they did really feel in, in that direction. That's why they were so proud to be longbirds and not really even given to the Empire, was just their natural enemy to, to a greater extent. Um, you know, and uh, sticking to that sort of identity. It was their people who did that, right? Uh, we do not have too much information on the chain of command. I actually made a research years ago, and I, I have a text I can use in another video if you're interested. We can go a bit more in depth. Uh, we just know that at, at the provincial level, the so-called judices, the judges, literally, and the school dies that were some other um, officers were responsible for the uh, recruitment of the fighters in, ca in, in case of uh, mobilization. And they had the faculty of um, granting exemptions. And in order to avoid that this could lead to corruption, like that uh, this power, this authority was abused uh, to the advantage of these people's clients or in exchange for bribes. King Lutbrand in 726 limited the number of those who could be exempted. Right? Which is also a harsh measure. When you look at Lutbrand's legislation, realize that there is this attempt overall in Longobard society to, to put an end to abuses of some sort, because more wealth was around, and some people were trying to take advantage of this, and the, the kingdom did not have, of course, the, the, the magic capacity like no state has even today to be to have a policeman around the corner every time. Um, but uh, there was this still order that allowed some sort of policing. In fact, most expeditions, the caballicaciones, for you, they were called like this because it, it means the rise, literally, were some sort of police service. Right, most expeditions, in a way, were about this chasing uh, brigands, um, you know, criminals, uh, things like that. Right, that's how the local, you know, uh, city would administrate his district, at, at similar things. So we don't have to think again about paramilitary stuff. These guys were again in the full average of Romano-Germanic warfare, but that's. In fact, also in the other regions, many ways, the, the degree by which uh, violence was used. Also because the system worked sort of better, right, than in a tribal uh, in a tribal context, right? So there you would have violence all the time, but also weaker, even weaker military systems. So here, everything again holds together, and so military service in major expeditions it's sort of more contained but there there is there are many occasions in which this happens after all uh, throughout all longbird history um 
Loot Prince limitation to the exemptions from military service were the following. Six men with war horse and ten without for the judge and half of the same for the school dais um, that in fact were like of lesser rank and those that did not would not participate had however to provide their horses or certain labor service uh, in uh, function of the logistical system that accompanied the army so as we've seen uh, the case of mobilization was a major work uh, just to supply the army and those who were not capable of arming themselves would still have to um, cooperate in other ways. Importantly enough and famously enough if you've studied Longobard history also the, the, the great um, clergymen were to go to war in case of royal uh, of coal, right? Uh, there, there is a famous letter, a, a testament, actually, uh, written uh, in July of 754 in front of the Frankish threat of Pippin the Short by the Bishop of Lucca, Walprand, that was uh, summoned at the following of King Heistulf himself, as he in fact describes. Um, in his will, he says, "I, Vualprand, Bishop, in the name of God, that on the or on or at the order of our Lord King Heistulf, I am, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm marching right, I'm about to march with the army at his, uh, uh, at his following. As a consequence, I have contemplated to dispose of all my." property in a way that if I will have deserved to survive I could sell them give um, give uh, give them sound or uh, making all that and judging it uh, in the way that I will uh, want while uh, if uh, I will happen to die in the expedition I want that all my goods will go for two-thirds to the Church of St. Martin. All right, so the level of militarization, after all, was not to be, uh, you know, to be underestimated for Longobard society as well. You know that bi medieval bishops were generally quite warlike, especially in certain contexts. Uh, generally speaking, again, all European countries have pretty warlike, especially if you look at Germany, France, Italy, uh, Spain, you, you do find this uh, pretty pretty frequently. And um, this has to do naturally with the political circumstances, but in this case, especially before the Gregorian reform, etc., the church, before the church developed particular immunities and progress, the, the idea is that this guy, yes, was a bishop, but he was also a Longobard. Right, and as such, he um, and his diocese fell properly within the Longobard kingdom and one also of the richest areas. So he had to go to war together with Heistoff. And uh, Wu knew him, by the way, so the, the artist had uh, evidently a connection, right? He was uh, called properly at the, at the king's retinue, so. There was there a, a, a political, other than a military, need uh, for these high figures to be summoned in the circumstances. So, there is another topic that we'll have to discuss at length and that we sort of addressed before a little bit, that is the one of the Longobard defeat against the Franks, right? There is not a, basically a victory that Longobard scored against the Carolingians. Uh, in previous times, of course, the, the Longobards had even crushed sometimes uh, Frankish invasions, etc. But uh, at the end of the 8th century, second half, you do have this repeated defeat at the hands of the Carolingians. In 755, Pippin the Short, 
humiliated the longbirds uh, and uh, forces them in a first submission. Then in 774, uh, there were actually multiple expeditions. They they ended basically all in the same way. In 774, um, you have Charlemagne's conquest, and you see basically the Longbird army melting away as, as soon as they were surrounded, but outflanked. Uh, there is all a strategic context that we we know a few about. So again, we're we were not there. Uh, the Longbirds had already been defeated by the Franks, so this was not the best, but they were still defending their country, and at least Charlemagne had to make a hell of a siege in order to reduce Pavia uh, to to obedience, right? And consider that normally uh, see this siege continued for nine months during winter as well. Um, they they were besieged in summer. They surrendered at Easter the, the, the year after. Um, this is unheard of in Carolingian warfare. So of course the Carolingians could afford that, but it was definitely not the norm. It was a gigantic enterprise, just like again, the coordination of the two columns of invasion uh, from the great Saint Bernard and uh, the Sousa Valley Pass, uh, respectively, uh, by. Bernard, in fact, was the name of the past. Uh, it was Charlemagne's uncle and Charlemagne himself. Uh, we'll surely make videos about this at some point on uh, Schwerpunkt to have to descend into the single wars, the single theaters, because otherwise it's just a bit too didascalic what I do in here. I mean, it's I like this analysis and all, uh, but knowing the histories behind those, uh, given I do, but. I haven't made videos yet about this are make old more interesting for for the watchers so it's uh, I think it's it's very it's very important to, to look at this in detail um, what you have is basically the longbirds are waiting for the Franks at the locks at the end of the Sousa Valley the Franks had historically managed to control the watershed of the Alps because they were the strongest power since the 6th to 7th century. Uh, so that's where the Longobard territory ended. Uh, this was the same uh, but reversed with the Longobards with the Bavarians. Uh, given that the Longobards were the stronger ones, they had territories in the, across the, say, in the Danubian Valley, basically, across the watershed. Um, the Franks had a hell of an army. The, they found out the way to surpass locks. Uh, we do not know how. I mean, it's just like a, saying like the Thermopylae, but all, say, conceptually, not in a different way. Um, and after this happens, the, the, the Longobard army melts away. But the way High Stolfos in the previous expeditions had risked his life, he had charged head down against the Franks. They showed enormous courage, but they, uh, they ended up Defeat. And again, the consistency of the Longobard army here is um, uh, is is, is uh, debated. In 774, you have the Zidarius, that was a quite uh, unliked king. And as we will see now, the sense is that just a chunk of the Longobard kingdom was fighting at the locks. Uh, the um, the consequence is again the si the siege of Pavia. Basically, Charlemagne ha conquered entirely the Regnum Langobardorum without even fighting properly a pitch battle, but still it had been a, a major uh, enterprise. So, as, as I was saying before, there are some takes on this historiographically by people that are actually not military historians by by profession. Uh, one is Chris Wickham. That, as you know, is one of. I had the pleasure of meeting him once at university. He's uh, is a very nice guy, etc. He wrote a lot, as you know, uh, to say the least, about um, the early Middle Ages. Uh, he is very much into uh, early medieval Italy as well, the longer birds, etc. And he's a bit of, um, you know, he he cares. I mean, it's the guy who cares about social economical stuff, right? So there is perhaps a pinch of determinism in his take, which, as we anticipated before, 
is that the Longobards would have paid for a, say, evident military inferiority due to the scarce spread of the great property. Right? Um, so, in other words, the heavy cavalry fielded by the Longbirds would have been too few and poorly equipped in order to cope with their Frankish counterparts that were more numerous and better armed. Uh, this is uh, too much of a deterministic take. Um, as I was saying before, I didn't think that this was too much of a factor just per se. I mean, the, the, the quantity is maybe there, even the, the equipment per se, but the point is also political in nature. Um, you take, when you study military history, you do not find things, ah, this, this army won because they had better armor and were simply more. It doesn't work like that, right? First of all, you have moral force, then you have, again, political cohesion, and then you have command, uh, and then you have uh, whatever can happen tactically, and largely we know zero about this, so just to say, oh, well, the Franks won because, you see, they had more troops and they were he more heavily armed, you know, the Longbirds had to lose. No, it doesn't work like this. That No society differs, especially in the early Middle Ages to this degree. Um, it's all true. I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the Frankish horseman was, on average, surely much more collectively trained, I would stress, if anything, that, um, than the Longbird one. On this, I completely agree. The extent by which, however, this would make this or that battle is uh, outcome is, is highly debatable. I like much more the explanation of a guy that I don't like particularly much, because once I... I disagree with many things he says about Longbird history, but he is uh, Stefano Gaspari. He's a, an Italian scholar that specializes in Longbird history. And he, uh, and I agree with him more, I mean, he um, also shares, as we just said, the hypothesis of a less uh, combative capacity of the Longbird army due to the fact that the Carolingian military clientels were much more developed because they had a different social system, a proto-feudal, vassalatic beneficiary mechanism, etc. But he actually is right uh, when he explains uh, the surrender of King Desiderius principally to the political contrasts that had uh, developed within the Longobard aristocracy in northern Italy. Uh, and the story is notorious. I mean, Desiderius had basically... He was an Austrian guy uh, who had been basically elected with papal and Frankish money after Italy had already been invaded by the Franks uh, in the previous expeditions that were, however, not uh, a conquest. I mean, the Franks entered... Uh, dictated their rule to ice to whatever, and then they came back across the Alps. They, did, they were not there to stay, right? The the Papas, in this sense, if, if the Pope had not called the Franks, you can't say that they would have never expanded into Italy, but in that specific historical context, they could have not. This is also an, uh, yeah. often forgotten as a call, also because they were allies up to that point, right? And, but these calls had made the, the Franks toying with the idea of conquering Italy once for for all, right? They, they, especially with a united empire, they would have obviously expanded the Mediterranean, whatever. But as we said, uh, Charlemagne also had had his brother, the, the, the Frankish Empire had been divided. It, it was not just to happen necessarily, right? But especially this election, basically, the Sidereus, as, as if he had been a puppet of the Franks and the Papacy, even though he sort of managed to shake this off of him, but remaining isolated, uh, had alienated much of his sympathies, uh, especially in the Austrian part of Italy. That is to say, as we were saying before, not just the one from which Heistulf, Rathkis, guys that had distinguished themselves in military service before their rise to monarchy in Lutprand's army, by the way, that thought highly of the Friulans, uh, but that were also um, much more proudly Longbird, right? They felt this greater sense of the Longbird tradition of their warlike uh, lifestyle. Of they, they had been the 
shield of the Longbird Kingdom against the Avars, the Slavs. They had, um, they were a less urban society, were sort of more, uh, less developed. In terms of military quality, they were higher or in, uh, in relative terms. And so they, um, they felt that a king that had just not been elected, according to Longbird Law, by the, the assembly of the free men in arms, uh, but by a foreign, but by foreign powers and the ones that had already insulted uh, Italy by invading it, was not worth uh, being followed. And so, uh, given that Desiderius was also not a particularly, uh, you know, effective ruler on his own and had managed to keep alienating his this this, this nobility because he basically, like other. Uh, other long birds at this point was trying to salvage in funding monasteries hoping that this would have not been plundered by the Franks etc uh, had lost essentially great part of the uh, long bird manpower right and when you know that there, and this is true but like we, we know that from the various histories etc of the time that basically half of the of the northern Italian uh, subject said nuts to the same Desiderius when basically self-sabotaged so obviously of course this lack of political cohesion was detrimental in many ways but the hatred this this is you see when historiography says um, you know the Longobard army was uh, excuse me the Longobard kingdom was divided hopefully because they started just literally the last year of Longobard history and at the very beginning when there was the ducal anarchy for 10 years or so but skipping the entire, you know, century and half of continuity and harmony and whatever. Uh, of course, this was a critical moment. Uh, there was a lot of pressure. And of course, you can argue, as we do also in other videos, that a bit that military inferiority is, of course, uh, the, the product of political fragmentation. I mean, it's just, uh, yesterday I was saying the same thing about the Celts and the Romans. I mean, it's a different, very different situation, but those people say, if the Celts had united, they could have tackled... Ro the, the Celts could not unite, right? Here, the Longobards are something different. We are in early medieval kingdoms, different, neatly separated regions of Europe. So again, there were lots of things that could actually happen. And so... I actually agree with uh, Gaspari regarding the fact that, at least also in a Clausewitzian sense, the most powerful indicator of why the Longobards lost in one shot in 774, and that was not even over yet, as we will see now, is the fact that they were politically quarreling, right? They were fragmented, and you can't really look at a Longobard horseman and say, oh, well, yeah, this is so different from a Frankish one. That's probably the least important aspect of it all, right? If there had even been a difference whatsoever. Um, so that would have uh, been the point. Uh, the Austrians hated Desiderius, and so they were hostile to him to the point of n never following him in war. And I would like to highlight the, the traditionalist mentality behind this. I mean, you couldn't, you could not... As we've said, when a people that had been entrusted, mm, bear in mind that Heistulf was Austrian, in that, uh, was from Friuli, uh, he, uh, th those were the peoples who had claimed that God had entrusted them the Romans. You, you cannot, and if you are a warlike individual who comes from that Friulian background, or not just Friuli, by the way, the Austria was, was also the Venetian area, etc., uh, Verona, this these places, they um, they would have not betrayed their own values to follow a king that they truly believe had not was a shameful one that had received his power just by somebody else and not by the Longobard people. I mean, they could not fight with him in that regard. So. That's where the video about the Battle of the Livenza River comes. Uh, to play, I made that. I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but to make long story short, in March of 776, so two years after Charlemagne had conquered Italy, that was at this point occupied and 
treated like it was, it was foreign people, right? They, they, they truly had their conquest felt. There was uh, uh, a regime change. It was a, a major shock, right? But these guys uh, from northeastern Italy basically took the field against Charlemagne, who was actually occupied in Central Europe, rushed to Italy. He spent, this was completely unusual, right? He spent um, winter at the on the Alpine foothills uh, in Germany and then entered Italy. And in March, he, uh, which uh, was when the Italians fought, you see the Franks normally started in May, right? The field of May, that's when because it's colder there so you need foray etc the Carolingian the Franks moved normally at that time but at this point Charlemagne rushed because the Franks in the early period freaked the hell out that about the fact that this massive thing of Italy it, in the easy way they had conquered could equally rebel and this was the case and as we've seen basically there are just two sources a Frankish one in a Longbird won for the battle. Uh, and they both claim victory f for their side, to, to their side, right? Uh, this is fascinating. Uh, I explained that historically, stere say, stereographically and philologically, um, looking at the authors who were they, especially the Longbird one, because he's a fairly reliable guy. Uh, and what turns out actually from the political events, because he writes a bit from not much later, right? This was a guy that knew the thing because it was the generation of the, his parents, I think, or something like that. Or uh, and uh, we know that, of course, the Longbirds did not achieve, achieve independence, whatever. But there is some hint of the fact that from there on, the Franks handled these eastern. Let's say the, the Longobard Dukes in general that in part had remained um, in some cases uh, the, the local aristocracy at least was very considered because they didn't use iron fist right they substituted some of the rebels that that happened so that looks like a Longobard defeat definitely but what happened on that day on the Levanza River nobody really knows so nobody really knows because it could have been a maybe a Longobard tactical defeat but still something that politically bled the, the Franks to the point that they decided to handle things with the usual ruthlessness because the, the Franks were not tender as you know but you see they, they would never behave against the longer birds in Italy against the, just the way they, they did against the Saxons in Germany right Italy was treated much better in, in, in this way and because they feared really that the system could rebel um, in any case, Charlemagne kept reigning undisturbed in northern Italy. So whatever happened there, the uh, the revolt failed. But this battle was said may have been actually won at that point uh, as an act of desperation. But still, with by the Longbirds as well, it's a possibility, right? You you may win the battle, but then being forced to surrender at the same time because you have exhausted your resources or stuff like that. So we do not know exactly what happened. We get this contrasting uh, evidence, but overall, we we think that, that was the last stand again of the Austrian uh, Longobard no nobility uh, to say we we have not been defeated yet. The Zidarius and his men have been defeated by the Franks. We, as long a true Longobards, haven't. So that's why they took the field. And they they had a hell of a of a courage evidently to face Charlemagne himself um, on the Levanza River. What to say? Uh, as I I do at the beginning, I, I always point this out. I mean, the, the Carolingians were a much bigger power than the Longbirds. I mean, you just take the map, uh, any map, and evaluate what was the Longbird basis of power. Essentially, the Po Valley and Tuscany at that point in a functional sense, especially after. And not even a completely functional sense, as we've seen, because there were political division. Some of the southern duchies had sort of sided with the papacy or had didn't want to oppose themselves to the Franks. So definitely not a, f a positive picture, but that's also what practically 
right, you know, the system is when it's at war, at least uh, after these defeats that already haven't deposed too favorably against them. But if you look at the map, you realize that the Franks had, like, the Longobard Kingdom as such was just as big as one of those regional powers that the Franks, the, Frank, the, the Carolingian Empire was composed by. <laughs> you know, it was just this thing versus multiple times that. And uh, you sure all the factors that we listed before have their weight. So when you actually level them, you realize that in terms of strict quality, we do not even know technically what the system was about. I mean, the, within 20 years, uh, the Carolingian Mills machine defeated heavily, and for good, by the way, the Avars, the Alamanni, the Saxons, uh, the also the Arabs of Spain were at point checked by, by the Carolingians. I mean, they, Charlemagne did push towards uh, the south after all, managed to militarize the Spanish, created the Spanish market and so on, in spite of the con the, the overall achievement. Uh, but uh, it, there, there is no reason why the, the, the Longbirds would have had to resist you know, after this list of defeated peoples, right? And uh, in this regard, it's uh, useful to observe the, I think, the, the cooperation of civilization. I mean, the, the Longobard Kingdom was by far the most civilized land that the Franks conquered. Uh, as such, uh, the Franks also substituted themselves to a ruling elite, but they made... Uh, an ample effort to continue making the Longobard state work, which is again what Charlemagne, his uh, administration, really that, that is meant by at this point by also by the local Longobards, right? That, that, that there are some cap capitulars that are very beautiful to read because the Franks literally, as soon as they arrive, they say something like, "You have you have to tell us how you were habituated to." make the thing work. You have to tell us who pays for the bridges, for the walls, because they were interested in maintaining first the strategic points of, of Italy and cooperating with the inhabitants. And it's all very um, instructive because you see a need of cooperation anyway. And so this, the fact that Carolingian Italy would be eventually the, the seat of the ruling imperial dynasty um, throughout the 9th century makes you realize how important this system after all really was and also uh, as we explained the other day in Carolingian times there is a functional Italic read Longobard army that the Franks lead um, and that uh, even in difficult times like the late uh, 9th century managed to pull off important feats like I don't know, the reconquest of Bari for example uh, from the uh, the Saracens uh, which the, the Byzantines, instead of what that was a Byzantine city, uh, that was a hell of a, you know, smack against Constantinople, um, and, and different other things. Then uh, talking about the Car Carolingian military is very complex uh, because it's so big and so underdocumented to some extent that uh, we still really have to begin doing that. I have made m multiple videos about Frankish warfare and history, but even very close to these topics, but it's really a, a universe on its own. We still have yet to dive properly into it. But just to make the long story short, I mean, the idea that the Longobards were just irreparably weak as a military system or that, you know, they should have held against the Franks um, just because it's not all considered something uh, proving. Uh, like, there is no... Uh, there is no actual proof, there is no actual way of measuring crucial factors that uh, are highlighted there, mostly politically in reason, and yes, they may have had a systemic uh, route in terms of how the, the kingdom, of course, had developed, etc., but uh, again, the Franks are the exception. All the other peoples they conquered were the average of those times, right, in terms of cohesion.
and you still have to appreciate that in spite of this uh, crumbling the Longobard army still had an important defensive capacity that only the, the Carolingian military machine could could force. I mean, at this point, nobody had the capacity around the Longobards to, say, enter Italy and besiege Pavia for nine months and taking it. Nobody. Not even remotely. It simply couldn't happen. Only the Franks. Um, and... Uh, and you don't have to just bet that they would have made it at the beginning of that expedition. So uh, there is uh, really a lot there you have to appreciate, both from the Longburn and, and the Frankish side, that is mostly reduced to, oh, okay, there was not even a final showdown with a pitch battle, whatever. There didn't have to be. I mean, um, also the other clashes against other peoples were quite modest after all I mean, you don't have a major battle if not between the various Franks right and so when if you are really outnumbered by a, a greater and stronger army and they they outflank you and they pass by essentially the the barrage that you have created to defend from I mean obviously you will put back uh, and you will at that point hope to to exist in this massive fortified cities of Robert that, that did not exist really north of the Alps in that at least the the way they had been continuously inhabited, uh, restructured, etc. Like in Italy, so uh, that's something that makes the long the 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 Carolingian army, the Carolingian warfare, the Carolingian military machine also grow, right and learn, right. You 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 can argue again that the tale of Charlemagne crushing the Lombards, etc. It's it's so important because uh, um, it had evidently left a mark at the time. It was something that impressed both, uh, impressed everyone, uh, because it, it was not to be meant as an easy feat, right? It was so, such a big deal, after all, in perspective that made it sort of made made the Longobar defeat more more clamorous, but also heightened dramatically uh, Charlemagne's glory. And of course, with the Carolingian conquest of Italy, you have the imperial, the Roman imperial crowning. You have the uh, reemergence of the Western uh, Empire, and uh, so many other things that there surpass any sort of uh, that's a spiritual, metaphysical, divine dimension that you must appreciate. And but the Longobards did participate. The, the Italic Kingdom lived uh, as a living testament. In fact of the Longobard civil administrative capacity uh, and, uh, and solidity. And that's something which uh, later in the Middle Ages was also proven by the later developments, etc. Uh, also, from a military point of view, right, the, the really overlooked uh, military topic in the Middle Ages are the Italian communal armies between the uh, most people think Legnano, the 12th century, all that, fight, but the the the, the 13th, is, the, the early 14th century, were literally the and easily the the single most advanced army in medieval times. Uh, I'm not kidding about that, uh, with the exception perhaps of of the Mongols, if you wanna uh, put a of course a counterpart, but those are also relative issues. I don't think so highly of the Mongols, honestly. I mean, I do. Uh, but in moral terms, but in, ter in terms of actual military effectiveness, I, don't, I think they, they're hyper, you know, uh, you know, they're over, uh, they're uh, overrated, right? The and everything you see, this, these are the same places of a history that, in general, nobody really studies well. Whenever I, I, I realize that when I make videos about medieval Italy, most people don't really watch it. I have the impression that between not really studying it in school or not really having maybe some other, you know, the dramatization, the almost the fictionalization of Italian history is, is a topos. It's um, in Western culture, especially in Anglo-Saxon culture, is, is a sort of... Uh, sort of drama again it, it, it's not like history for real uh, just like the renaissance the, the, it's a 
it's a topos that as such must be filled with certain specific ideas but the actual history the, the solidity of of its basis it, it's something that in my opinion western culture i think also in italy is it, being removed like it, it, nobody studies italian history properly especially from a military point of view and uh during the middle ages especially it's it's uh it's incredibly overlooked and I, perhaps i will start making videos of this kind like picking single countries and highlighting like how do we really think them what is about them that people think during the Middle Ages, say, about their warfare, why or not, what 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 historiographical currents affected this, what kind of um let's say cultural perceptions altered it, you know. That that's very important to do. Uh, it's possibly the single I, I'm sure perhaps this would get me even more views, but I like also to start from the actual basis. So videos like this, I think, are really important. And I'm glad we talked about the longer birds um, yet again. There's really a lot to tell. Like, you have no idea of how much stuff we have to cover. But the only thing that comforts me is that really there are there is no way to exhaust the topics. We can always talk about everything endlessly. That's what this channel is about. Anyhow, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.